Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So before we get into today's case, I wanted to share an announcement. I have created a Facebook page that has shortened versions of any video that I post on my channel. I have covered a bunch of older cases and will continue posting all of the time with content from recent and older cases. So if you're looking for more short form videos or more summaries of cases that I've covered on this channel, or if you want to go back and review older cases that I've posted in the past, make sure you go ahead and check that page out and make sure you go ahead and give that page a like and a follow if you want to see some shortened versions of cases that I've covered on this channel and will continue to post pretty regularly on that page as well. So the case that I have for you all today is one that I've actually been following since the very beginning stages of the case. Literally within days of the case happening, I was going to cover it, but it got worked out so quickly and solved so quickly that I decided to wait until we had a resolution. And as of right now, we know what happened in the case. We also know a lot more information than we did before. They were being very close to the vest with releasing information in the early stages. But now we know a lot more of what was actually going on in this case. So with that being said, let's just jump into the case. Rebecca Bernadette Postel Bleefneck was born in Quincy, Illinois, where she attended Payson Seymour Elementary School and then at Quincy Notre Dame High School, where she was named valedictorian. She then went on to Quincy University, where she got her bachelor's degree in biological science and a minor in chemistry. She went on to work for Santa Fe Adventist as one of their top performing pharmaceutical sales reps. But after that, she decided that she wanted to work in a more hands-on position where she could make a direct difference in others' lives. So Rebecca started school at Blessing Riemann College of Nursing and Health Sciences and started working as a nurse. After getting her nursing degree, she went on to get two other credentials, one as a certified trauma nurse specialist and a sexual assault nurse examiner. Those who Rebecca took care of during her time as a nurse described her as exceptional. She worked as a travel nurse during the COVID pandemic, and during that time, she was nominated for the International Daisy Award, which gives honor to exceptional care given by outstanding nurses. One of her patients stated about her, quote, I got to kiss my husband and tell him how much I loved him all because of Becky. There are no words to express how grateful I am for what she did. By 2009, Rebecca got married to a man named Tim Bleefneck. He attended Quincy University as well, and he was known for being a star football player. He's believed to have worked for Quincy Farm Products in business development at some point, and at the time of Rebecca's murder, he was working as a sales executive. After that, the couple went on to have three children, all sons named Deacon, Grayson, and Arlen. Those who knew Rebecca described that her three sons were her greatest gifts. She was such a devoted mother, creating her son's Transformers costumes on Halloween, making their first day of school posters every school year, and she got down and dirty with her boys with fishing and frog hunting and anything sports related. At the same time, Rebecca was also known for her service to her community. She volunteered for five years at the St. Peter's Grade School Association. Those who she volunteered with considered her a tremendous asset who was always willing to help or pitch in. She helped coordinate mother-son events. She helped plan teacher conference luncheons and other school-related events. She also loved animals and worked at a nonprofit all-volunteer animal rescue group in her hometown. Rebecca was also known to be a devout Catholic. Both her high school and her college were Catholic schools, and she tried to raise her children in the Catholic Church to try and instill her love for God in those boys. Now, as most of you may have anticipated with a case like this, the marriage between Rebecca and Tim was not very good, to say the least. It turned out that for the prior two years, the couple was going through divorce proceedings. Because of Rebecca's faith, she wanted to stay in the marriage with Tim for as long as she could. She wanted the couple to go to marriage counseling and try to mend things between them for the sake of their children. She wanted to be a united nuclear family for her children, but that didn't end up working as Tim had filed for divorce in January of 2021 and things were pretty turbulent that entire time. At the time, the two were living separately. Rebecca lived in the home that she and Tim had once lived in, their marriage home, which was located at 2528 Kentucky Road. 
and Tim lived about a mile away at 1641 Hampshire Street in a house that he rented. The other big part of this case that made the headlines is that Tim and his family were actually on an episode of Family Feud, which aired in 2020. On that episode, he made a joke which a lot of people see as being a bit of foreshadowing for this horrible crime, when he asked what his biggest mistake you made at your wedding was, he said, honey, I love you, but I do. When people looked surprised at him saying this, he said, not my mistake, I love my wife. What's the biggest mistake you made at your wedding? Honey, I love you, but said I do. Oh. <laughs> not my mistake. Not my mistake. I love my wife. Now, this case starts on February 23rd, 2023, when Rebecca's husband, Tim, texted Rebecca's father, Bill, asking him if he could call Rebecca and ask if she was picking up the boys from school because she wasn't responding to any of his text messages. So, Bill decided to just head over to Rebecca's home where he found that the front door was open. This immediately struck Bill as odd because, obviously she always kept the front door closed. He said that when he went inside, he called her again, but he got no answer. So he went to the garage to see if she had left, and that is when he saw that her car was still in the garage, so she should have been home. So he went up to her bedroom to check on her to see if maybe she was laying down because she was sick or something like that but in her bedroom, her father did not see her. Then he checked the bathroom that connected to her bedroom, and that is when Bill discovered the body of his daughter. He said that he immediately knew that she was dead when he found her, but just by natural reflex, he went in to check her pulse, and of course, there wasn't one. He said by that point, he felt that rigor mortis had already kicked in. She was gone. It turned out that 41-year-old Rebecca had been murdered. Bill immediately ran over to a neighbor's house to call 911 and his wife, Bernie, who then came to pick him up. Once Bernie picked Bill up, he called Tim on the phone to let him know what happened and Tim acted surprised. He said that the school called him because Rebecca hadn't picked up the kids from school, but he didn't know that anything had actually happened to her. By 3.23 p.m. that day, police arrived to the scene and found that Rebecca had been shot multiple times. According to later autopsy, it turned out that Rebecca had actually been shot 14 times. She had been shot nine times to her chest, three times in her right arm, and two times to her left hand. Because of where all of these bullet wounds were, none of them were immediately fatal. Also at the scene, it was a little bit strange because there actually was not a lot of blood. Like, she wasn't lying in a pool of blood like you would expect from somebody who had just been shot nine times. This was because she had actually just gotten an abdominal surgery just a few days before she was shot, and so she was still wearing those compression guards garments, so that kind of held the blood in. That meant that when she was shot, most of the bleeding was internal bleeding, so because of all of these different factors, the medical examiner determined that Rebecca was alive for several minutes after being shot, and she probably died a slow, painful death. Also, at the scene, police found six or seven spent shell casings on the bedroom floor, along with some fragments of wood, this appeared to be pieces of wood from the doorframe of the bedroom. The officer then noticed that there looked to be damage on the bedroom door as if it had been kicked in and open. So that kind of seems to be where the wood pieces on the floor came from. They also found a damaged window with broken glass on the second floor of the home. Then near and around her body, police found what looked like tiny bits of plastic all around. Immediately, police started their investigation into what could have possibly happened. Of course, with any type of case where someone is murdered, the police first went and spoke to Tim, her ex-husband. When he was initially questioned, police said that he was fully cooperative. He was answering their questions and he seemed very upset when he learned of Rebecca's death. He gave the police a DNA swab and he was on his way. But as police continued their investigation, they realized that not only were the couple going through a divorce, but it seemed that Rebecca may have feared for her safety in the years before her murder. So in the year while the divorce proceedings were happening and after the two had actually moved out of the home and were living separately, 
Rebecca made it clear to multiple friends and coworkers that Tim had been showing concerning behaviors and that she was afraid that he was going to run away with the children and she said that he was being abusive towards her. She messaged one friend named Christine on May 7th, 2021, saying, quote, He has screamed in my face. He shoved me in front of the kids. He has thrown things across the room where the kids and I were standing and punched a hole in the wall. If things really don't go his way, I feel that he can be very unstable and unpredictable, and the thought has gone through my mind on if I may need a restraining order. I'm definitely changing the locks as soon as I can. By September 8th, 2021, she sent Christine another text saying, Tim is going to come after me and do the same if he continues to not get his way. She also went on to say that Tim has some serious mental health issues and that she is afraid to get an order of protection against him because of his mental health issues. She was afraid that he was going to secretly take the children and run away with them. Throughout this time as well, Rebecca had been working with two different divorce attorneys. First was Denny Woodworth, who said that he helped Rebecca get a temporary order of protection against Tim that ordered him to give Rebecca back a CZ-75 9mm firearm that Rebecca had purchased but it was in possession of Tim at that time. Rebecca argued that at the time, she wanted the gun for personal protection, but Tim never handed it over. When he was asked about the gun, Tim said that he didn't know where the gun was and he hadn't seen it in a year. So after that, Rebecca reported this firearm as stolen, and again, she never got access to that gun. I do also want to note now that in September of 2021, Tim actually filed for an order of protection against Rebecca, saying that he felt harassed and threatened by her. Then, in October of 2021, Rebecca filed one against Tim. In Rebecca's request, she wrote that she needs protection against harassment, physical abuse, and interference with personal liberty. She also asked the court to prevent Tim from entering their marital home without her permission but the courts denied both Tim and Rebecca's orders. Then, in November of 2021, another lawyer named Jerry Timmerwilk took over Rebecca's case. Again, as I mentioned, the divorce proceedings were very contentious. There was very little agreement in any aspects of their case. The two argued over who got what type of custody over the children, and there was a huge point of contention with Tim's father Ray's visitation of the children as well. At one point, Rebecca wanted it so that Ray could not have any unsupervised visits with the children. I don't know the exact reasons behind this, but it seems that Rebecca may not have trusted Ray with her children. In one message in May of 2021, she wrote to a friend, quote, Tim told me that if I outed his dad, that Ray would probably have to move and then he would kill himself. Then, by December 16th of 2021, she actually filed an ordinance of protection against Ray, Tim's father. So, obviously, all of that is very concerning, but it doesn't necessarily mean that Tim had been violent per se. Even Rebecca's divorce lawyer said that things between them, the animosity and bad feelings, it went both ways. They also said that they had never seen any signs of domestic abuse or ever had any reason to suspect that Rebecca's life or physical well-being was in danger. But then, police found messages dating all the way back to September 4th of 2020. In these messages, Rebecca told her sister, Sarah, that if anything happened to her, that Tim would be the number one suspect. In the text, she wrote, quote, if something ever happens to me, please make sure that the number one person of interest is Tim, as that is who would do something to me. I am putting this in writing that I'm fearful that he will somehow harm me, come after me, or will try to do something to me that take away from the kids or the kids away from me. He has already lied multiple times to paint himself as the victim, as me as the perpetrator, and it absolutely is the other way around. Then, yet another witness who was a co-worker of Rebecca's named Sarah, she came out to talk about her experiences with Rebecca in the months leading to her death. She said that ever since the two started working together in early 2022, Rebecca would regularly talk to her about her divorce. Sarah told the police that Rebecca told her that if anything ever happened to her, to make sure to look at Tim. She also said at the time, she wasn't sure what to make of the conversation and she thought that Rebecca was just venting, so that's why nothing was ever reported before her death. Then, another coworker named Melissa told the police that she ran into Rebecca in January of 2023 
and she noted that Rebecca was looking very mentally and emotionally exhausted. Rebecca told Melissa that Tim could snap at any moment. She said that Tim told Rebecca that she would be dead before she got any of his money. Melissa said that she hadn't seen Rebecca in years at that point, so she thought that it was odd that Rebecca had given her all of that information for seemingly no reason. I also want to mention that as I mentioned earlier in the video, Tim said that the school had called him and told him that Rebecca had not come to pick the kids up. But police followed up on that and they actually found out that the school didn't call Tim. They said that Tim actually called the school and he asked them if he could pick up the kids from school an hour early and then surveillance cameras confirmed that he did that. So clearly that part of his story was not adding up. The school didn't call him and he somehow knew that Rebecca was not going to pick up their children from school that day. It also came out that during that same time in early 2023, Rebecca had started seeing someone. She started dating a man named Ted Johnson. Ted Johnson reported to the police that on February 13th, 2023, he had come over to Rebecca's home to celebrate Valentine's Day, so he went over and spent the night at that home. So he went over and spent the night that night with Rebecca. As police continued their investigation, they were able to find surveillance cameras at a neighbor's house who captured an unknown individual riding a bicycle without reflectors on the tires in front of Rebecca's house between 12 a.m. and 1 a.m. on February 14th. They couldn't identify the person riding this bike, but they did find a blue Schwinn Sidewinder bicycle without reflectors on the wheels just down the street from Tim's home. So obviously the thought here is that the bike belonged to Tim. Police actually tracked down the Facebook Marketplace ad originally posted for the same bike, and the seller said that the man who bought it was tall, slender, and white with brown hair, and he was using a Facebook page with the name John Smith, so it was a clear alias for someone. He basically gave the police Tim's description, but he said that if he saw the man again who he sold the bike to, he probably would not be able to identify him. Then in January of 2023, a neighbor came forward to report that Tim had asked his neighbor if he had a surveillance camera that faced his house, to which the neighbor said no, he didn't. So again, clearly Tim was trying to go around and figure out where this surveillance camera could be for whatever reason. So obviously at this point, police really started to believe that Tim could have been the one responsible for murdering his ex-wife. So by March 1st of 2023, police went ahead and executed a search warrant on Tim's home and they found quite a few things of interest. First, let's go over the cell phone data that was found on his phone. So just as I mentioned, there was a neighbor who saw that someone was riding their bicycle in front of their house in the middle of the night on February 14th, the same time that Rebecca and her new man, Ted, were spending time together at the house. Now, Tim wears a W-H-O-O-P armband. I don't know if you pronounce it WHOOP or if it's just spelled out that way because it's in all caps when it's referred to in these articles. But basically, you wear this to track your activity levels like heart rate, sleep, and things like that. His armband disconnected at midnight and then his phone remained unused. And this was around the same time, again, that the bicycle was seen riding around Rebecca's house. Then after the bike was seen riding around Rebecca's house between 1.10 a.m. and 1.30 a.m., Google searches on Tim's laptop history show searches for license plate lookup, title registration lookup, VIN check lookup, and vehicle records. Then it showed that he looked up Ted Johnson's exact VIN and license plate number in Google. So again, like I just mentioned a minute ago, Tim was at Rebecca's house that night and he spent the night the same night that the bike was seen riding around in front of the house and the same night that Tim looked up Ted's VIN numbers. Then at 1.30 a.m., his Whoop armband reconnected. At 1.32 a.m., the Missouri Department of Revenue, which handles vehicle registration, they get a phone call. Then on February 21st, this is about when Rebecca was recovering from her abdominal surgery that she had just gotten a few days prior. At around 12.30 p.m. that same day, Rebecca texted Tim, asking her if he could keep the kids overnight for the next few days. That same day, Ted went over to Rebecca's house to help take care of her and spend some time with her. 
I believe he stayed the night and left on the 22nd. Then the same day, in the early morning hours of the 22nd, Tim's armband disconnected at 12.42 a.m. and reconnects at 12.19 a.m. That same time, there is surveillance video of the same person riding their bike around Rebecca's house. Then, a surveillance camera picks up the biker traveling southeast past Quincy Public School's bus barn, and this is in the same direction of Rebecca's home and away from Tim's home. So, at the same time that this biker was seen going from, you know, the direction of Tim's home to Rebecca's home, that's the same night that Ted had slept over at Rebecca's home. So if it was Tim riding his bike in front of Rebecca's house, then he would have seen that Ted's car was parked in the driveway. Then now going into the early morning hours of February 23rd, once again, Tim's phone locks and it isn't being used at 12.28 a.m. And then at 12.26 a.m., Tim's armband also disconnects. Once again, video surveillance captured a bicyclist riding past the Quincy bus barn at 12.55 a.m. Then, police did do an extraction of Rebecca's phone. As I stated earlier, they read a lot of those concerning text messages in the months and years prior to her death. In the early morning hours of February 22nd, Rebecca's phone showed that she was on Facebook at 12.58 a.m. This was the last activity on her phone until 1.11 a.m. when she dialed 91126 on her phone. Police believe that she was attempting to call 911 at this time. Then by 1.16 a.m., video surveillance shows a bicyclist heading northwest past the Quincy bus barn, back away from the direction of Rebecca's home, and then towards Tim's home. By 2.07 a.m., Tim's phone unlocks and there's now activity. Then upon looking more at Tim's internet search history, it showed that sometime in February before the murder took place, Tim made the following searches. How to open a door with a crowbar. How to make a homemade silencer. How to wash off gunpowder. Average Quincy Police Department response time. Now, let's talk about the pieces of physical evidence that investigators found in the home. First, they found a few different Aldi grocery bags around the house. Aldi is a grocery store located in the Midwest, and they may have, like, other locations outside of the Midwest, but I know that they have a ton in the Midwest, and I believe it's more of a Midwest chain. But police said that the plastic that these bags were made out of matches the plastic bits found all around Rebecca's body. So again, the plastic bags were found in Tim's home and they match some of the bits that were found on Rebecca's body. Police theorized based on those pieces that were found around Rebecca and his internet search history that Tim had most likely used this Aldi bag as a homemade silencer when he allegedly shot his wife. Then they found that there was a crowbar in the basement of Tim's home. They used that to compare to the marks that they found on the upstairs window that had been damaged to see if the marks that this crowbar made matched the marks on the window that had been damaged. And they did find similarities when they did this testing, but unfortunately, it was not enough to make a conclusive match, but it was enough for them to be pretty confident that this was probably the crowbar that was used to break into Rebecca's home. Once again, police believed that Tim had used this crowbar to open the window of her home and then break in that way. Police also found 27 shell casings in Tim's home, all of which matched the shell casings used in Rebecca's murder. So, based on all of this evidence that they found, by March 13th, 10 days after Rebecca's body was found, Tim was arrested and charged with two counts of first-degree murder and one count of home invasion in connection to Rebecca's murder. At his arraignment, he pleaded not guilty. Now, I found this to be relatively quick because with a lot of cases, trials don't happen for a year or more after that person is arrested, but with this case, the trial started very quickly. By May 23rd, 2023, the trial for murder started. The prosecution started by talking about the contentious divorce that the couple was going through, where they literally could not agree on anything. They brought up how there was a divorce hearing that was set just one week before Rebecca's death. Then the prosecution spelled out the night that the murder took place. They said that Tim had looked up on Google how to break into someone's home with a crowbar, how to make a silencer, how to wash off GSR, and how fast police would respond before he rode his bike to Rebecca's house, which was located a mile away from his house. They said that Rebecca was home alone that night because her children were supposed to be at Tim's house. 
Then she heard something loud, the sound of somebody breaking into her home. That is when Tim had climbed up on the side of the house to the second floor and then used a crowbar to break into the home through the window. Then the prosecution argues that she ran into her bedroom where she grabbed her phone and frantically dialed 911 as Tim chased her. But just as she was trying to dial 911, she was also trying to shut the bedroom door which was then pushed open by Tim. And then that happening was what knocked the phone out of Rebecca's hand. So she wasn't able to actually call 911. And it seems that when the phone was knocked out of her hand, that is when like extra buttons were pushed, which is why it was 91126 and not just 911. So they say that Rebecca ran into the bathroom, but Tim pursued her. They argued that she turned around to look and just as she did so, she was shot and fell to the ground. They said that as she laid on the ground helpless, looking up at her husband, he looked down at her and shot her 14 times. Then he ran away and fled as Rebecca laid there, slowly dying in complete agony. The prosecution argued that Tim felt that he had to make sure that the three boys him and Rebecca shared had no choice but to choose him after their parents split up so he did just that by eliminating one of the other options completely. They talked about the internet searches, the surveillance camera, how his armband disconnected. Basically with the armband, since it does track your activity, the argument is that he took the armband off when riding his bike to Rebecca's house those different times to stalk her so that his activity wouldn't be traced and it wouldn't show like the route that he took because with those type of armbands, they'll, you know, have a GPS monitor to show what route you took. So he took that off to make sure that he wouldn't be tracked because obviously... He didn't want anybody to know that he was riding his bike around Rebecca's house at that time. Now, I don't know if they made this argument for sure, but in my opinion, I think that him going to Rebecca's house all those different times, like the first time seeing that there was a car parked there, I think he looked up the VIN number and the license plate to see who it was, to see if maybe it was like a new car or if it was, you know, someone else that would be in the home that would make it harder for him to kill Rebecca. And then I think the night before on the 22nd, when he went to her house again to, you know, look and see if anyone was there, I think he was checking to see if there was anybody at the house. And when he saw that there was somebody there, obviously he had to go home because he can't kill her then because someone else might stop him and get in the way. So then I think when he went there the final time on the 23rd, that is when he saw that nobody was there, that she was home alone. And that is when he decided to carry out the act. So I think that's why it was so obvious and clear that this was first degree premeditated murder. Going on with the trial, the prosecution talked about the Aldi bags, which again matched the bits of plastic found all over Rebecca's body. They discussed the bullets found within the home, which matched the bullets used to kill Rebecca. The defense, on the other hand, they argued that this was actually the case of a robbery gone wrong. They said that the surveillance video of the bicyclist couldn't be positively identified as being John, let alone anybody else. They said that you can't tell the race of this person, the gender, or literally any other identifying characteristics about them. So it can't be stated with confidence that this was even John to begin with. They said that there was no fingerprints found on the bike that was thought to belong to Tim and there was no DNA found on the bullets or at the scene such as on the doorknob or the window or any other place that could directly tie it to Tim being there and being the one to break in. They said that testing on the crowbar thought to be used in this break-in was also inconclusive as well. They said that even though it matched, it couldn't be 100% stated as fact that this was the crowbar used. And I also believe that they could not find any DNA or fingerprints on the crowbar as well. The defense basically asked the jury to use their common sense. They said that none of these things directly connected Tim to the crime, so there's no way that they could find him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So after a week of trial, the jury of six men and six women went off for their deliberations. I'm honestly really surprised at the short amount of time that the jury deliberated, but they only deliberated for about four hours before they came back with their verdict. They found that Tim Bleefnick was guilty of the first degree murder of his ex-wife, Rebecca Bleefnick. For this, he actually has not yet been sentenced at the time that I'm making this video since the trial did end so recently, 
but the prosecution is looking for a life sentence with a minimum of 45 years behind bars before he is considered for parole. So that is where this case ends. As with any other recent case that I cover, whenever I do get an update about his sentence or if there is any more information that comes out about this, I will keep you all updated. I'm honestly really surprised that the jury was able to come to a conclusion with this case because I do truly think that there was not a lot of physical evidence to tie Tim to this crime. Like, I honestly think that this could have been a case where he wasn't found guilty or it was a hung jury because of how little evidence there was. And I think that one of the big things that really made the jury have their actual decision was the fact that they were going through such a nasty divorce and that Rebecca did confide in friends that he was showing this concerning behavior. I also saw in one article that the juror said that the one thing that really locked in the guilty conviction for them was the fact that there were bullets in Tim's home that matched the bullets that were used to kill Rebecca. They said that really is the one thing that got them to get that guilty verdict. But either way, this is a truly devastating case. Tim selfishly ripped those three boys away from both of their parents and that is just the worst thing that you could possibly do. I don't know what the motive was for Tim to kill Rebecca. I don't know if he was jealous that she was starting to see somebody else. I don't know if it truly was just because he wanted sole custody of the boys that seems to be like the biggest motive here, but it could have been a combination of so many different things. I personally think that even if he was jealous that she was seeing somebody else because you could see like, oh, he looked up the VIN number on the car and that must mean that he did that because he's like raging and jealous. I think it's more so because he wanted to find out who was there to see, you know, is this person gonna get in the way of me killing Rebecca? But either way, again, this is a truly selfish case for this horrible monster. He's a terrible person, and I'm really sad that this case happened the way that it did with all of the red flag behaviors that Tim was showing. I'm sad that she couldn't get herself out of the situation. I'm sad that it ended this way, and I'm sad that those three little boys don't get to have either of their parents in their lives anymore. But that is where I am going to end today's video and now I want to know what your guys' thoughts are about this case. What do you think Tim's true motive was and what do you think about the situation overall? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below and make sure you go ahead and check out my new Facebook page and give that a like and a follow as well. If you have any case suggestions, please make sure you fill out the Google form that I have listed down below as well. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!